Okay, um, welcome everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us this evening for a presentation and discussion of an academic paper, Safe Seats and Female Underrepresentation in the U.S. Congress uh, by Akhil Rajan, Alexander Kustov, Makel Serda, Francis Rosenbluth, and Ian Shapiro. Uh, this event is part of a series of events that ISPS, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, is holding this year uh, called ISPS Democracy. And these events bring together experts from Yale and beyond to shed light on key questions concerning American politics, governance, and democracy. The next event in this ISPS Democracy series will be Tuesday, April 13th, at 4 p.m., our regular time is seven, but this is at 4 p.m., Rethinking Political Representation, where we'll have a number of experts on novel ways of holding elections and engaging in legislative deliberations. Um, before I continue on to discuss tonight's event, I wanna make sure to thank um, the organizers of this event, uh, Pam Green, Pam LaMonica, Tori Bilski and Lamore Peer. So here are the logistics for tonight's event. We'll have the authors present their work for about 20 minutes. After that, we'll have about 10 minutes each from two discussants that we've invited to this event. And then after the discussants um, conclude, the panelists will have an opportunity, paper presenters will have an opportunity to respond to the discussants after which we'll have some time for questions from the audience. And here's how the audience will ask questions. Uh, please save your questions till after the discussants have concluded their remarks and use the raise hand button on the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, to, to indicate that you have a question you'd like to ask. Also, if you'd like, you can send questions to the panelists via the chat. And if you do that um, through the chat, um, keep the questions reasonably concise so that they can be uh, read and, and, and understood uh, easily. And I just also want to indicate that tonight's event is, is being recorded. With that, let me introduce uh, tonight's participants. First, the presenting authors. Ian Shapiro is the Sterling Professor of Political Science at Yale University. He served as chair of political science uh, from 19, 1999. No, that's, I think that, I, that's, I bet longer than that. He served as chair of political science for a number of years, very successful and wonderful years. And you also served as the director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies from 2004 to 2019. Ian is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Social Insurance. He has written widely and influentially on democracy, justice, and methods of social inquiry. His current research concerns the relations between democracy and the distribution of income. Our second presenter is Akhil Rajan. Rajan is a senior at Yale, at Yale College enrolled in the simultaneous BA MA program in political science and the multidisciplinary academic program in human rights. Rajan studies the intersection of political behavior and populism, as well as policy responses to the threat of democratic backsliding. He was an ISPS director's fellow in 2019 and a Dahl scholar during the 2018-2019 academic year. Alex Kustov, is a postdoctoral associate in the Leitner Program on Effective Democratic Governance in the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. His research focuses on public policy responses to immigration and ethnic conflict in high-income countries. He received his PhD in politics and social policy from Princeton and will be an assistant professor of political science and political administration at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte uh, starting in August of 2021. And I do wanna recognize the non-presenting authors, 
uh, who well, are not going to be uh, making a presentation tonight, but contributed uh, very much to the paper. Uh, Francis Rosenbluth uh, is the Damon Wells Professor of Political Science at Yale, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a um, a leading scholar of comparative political economy um, and a, a beloved colleague. Her current work focuses on the electoral micro foundations of different forms of capitalism on the politics of gender inequality. She published many articles on, on a variety of subjects, um, some recently on the political economy of gender and on women's underrepresentation in politics. Her recent book with Ian Shapiro was Responsible Parties, Saving Democracy from Itself, published in 2018. And then the fifth author on this paper is Michael Serta. Uh, Serta is a postdoctoral fellow at Yale University, received a PhD in economics from NYU. Serta's research interests include industrial organization, competition policy, statistical learning, and applied microeconomics. So those are our paper authors. Uh, I'll finally conclude with uh, our two discussants. Our two discussants are Francis Lee and Jonathan Rodden. Francis Lee is a professor of politics and public affairs and associate chair at the Department of Politics uh, at Princeton University, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, her research centers on American politics with a special focus on congressional politics, national policy making, party politics and representation. She is the editor of the Cambridge Elements series in American politics and her recent book, Insecure Majorities, Congress and the Perpetual Campaign explored the rise of congressional party conflict showing how shifts in competitiveness had a profound impact on how Democrats and Republicans interact in the policy sphere Lee is the recipient of the highest prizes for her scholarship in America from the American Political Science Association. She received the Richard Fenno Prize for the best book in legislative studies. And she is a two-time recipient of the D.B. Hardman Prize presented by the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation for the best book <laughs> on the US Congress from the fields of biography, history, journalism, and political science. I'll just say that there's no one who is a finer scholar of the contemporary Congress who's actively writing now than, um, than Professor Lee. It is a true delight to, to have her with us tonight. Um, Jonathan Rodden. Jonathan Rodden is a professor of political science at Stanford University. He is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. He is the founder and director of the Stanford Spatial Social Science Lab, the Center for Research and Teaching focuses on focusing on geospatial analysis in the social sciences. That's a subject that Jonathan is, is among the world's experts on that subject, the geo, geospatial analysis of, of politics. Um, Rodden's interests lie at the intersection of political science, public economics, and geography. He's the author of a number of books, including a 2007 book, Hamilton's Prom Paradox, The Promise and Peril of Fiscal Federalism, and he, for which he was the recipient of the Gregory Luber Prize for the best book in comparative politics in that year. Um, again, thank you, Jonathan. Welcome back to Yale. Jonathan was a, uh, a student here a number of years ago, and it's, it's wonderful to have you back. So with that, um, let me turn it over to, I believe Ian is gonna go first. Um, let me turn it over to Ian. After Ian and, uh, Ra and uh, Akil and Alexander are done, we'll go immediately to Francis and then Jonathan, the panelists will have their discussion and then they will, you will, we'll go immediately to question and answer. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, and thank you, Pam and Lee Moore, for doing all the, the heavy lifting to get us here this evening. Thank you also to Francis and Jonathan for um, agreeing to do this. We very much appreciate it, and we look forward to your comments. Um, 
I'm just going to talk briefly about the project out of which this paper came, and then I will turn it over to um, Akil and then Alex to present different parts of this particular paper. Um, as Alan mentioned, this work comes out of the Leitner Program on Effective Democratic, Democratic Governance at the Jackson Institute uh, that Francis Rosenbluth and I uh, run. And we should take note that all of the research here is uh, paid for by Jim Leitner through that program, and we wouldn't be able to do it, but for his generosity. The, the remit if of the of the program is to study which types of democracy are most conducive to good public policy and within democratic systems as we find them, as we've inherited them, if you like, what institutional reforms would, would make them uh, operate more effectively and produce better public policy. This is the work uh, that, uh, this one stream of this work that Alex, Michael, Akil, and I have been doing with Francis that has produced several papers and is producing several more. Um, and they've all focused in one way or another on um, the uh, organization and governance of political parties and how that affects political outcomes. Um, in the US, this has led us to, uh, to devote a lot of attention to the study and of the operation and evolution of the primary system. Of course, at the presidential level, that's only been since the 1970s when they became important. But at the congressional levels, as everyone knows, primaries have been around since the progressive era. So it's not just primaries that uh, have gotten our attention, but rather the interaction between primaries and safe seats. Uh, and we built up a data set on the growth of safe seats that they're going to be talking about tonight. And so uh, we've been looking at that more generally as it relates to things like party discipline and the capacity um, to produce uh, policies that are good for the economy in the longer run. This particular research comes out of the intersection between that and Francis Rosenbluth's ongoing interest in female representation. And so that, that was bringing the, those two streams of, of interests together that have resulted in the paper that that we're gonna talk about tonight. So with that, let me turn it to, over to Akil. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, uh, thank you, Professor Shapiro. Let me just load those slides up. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming out today. So as Professor Shapiro was saying, uh, we're gonna be looking at the problem of the rise of safe seats in the United States and how that's gonna help us understand uh, this growing phenomenon of women's underrepresentation in the US Congress. But before I dive into that, I want to start with a brief roadmap for where we're going to go in our presentation today. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the problem and the conventional explanations for this gender gap between the parties in women's representation in Congress. Then we're going to shift over to talking about our story, contrary to these conventional explanations, that safe seats are to blame. Uh, Alex is going to hop on and talk about the connection between safe seats and extremism. And then we're going to loop back to this question of safe seats and women's representation. We'll have a little bit of a discussion and questions for further scholarly inquiry. Uh, and then we're excited to get some feedback from our wonderful uh, discussants here today. So to just ground us in the idea of the problem, uh, it's well documented across political science and also across popular media that women are dramatically underrepresented in the United States Congress. But what is sometimes less appreciated is the trajectory of how things are changing. Within the Democratic Party, we are seeing substantial uh, gains for women politicians, especially in the House of Representatives, uh, slightly less gains in the Senate, but among Republicans, we're actually seeing very anemic growth. And one way to look at that is in the partisan gap in women members of the US House. Uh, so if you go all the way back to 1985 to the 99th Congress, there was no partisan gap. There was an equal number of women and men, uh, sorry, of women elected from the Democratic and the Republican Party. Versus today, you see a huge gap of upwards of 60 seats between the two of them. Most famously, we saw this in 2018, which was heralded as the year of the woman for the record number of women who were elected to Congress. But actually, if you look at the closer at the data, 
a record number of Republican women lost their seats. So when we're talking about this gender gap in representation, it's also important that we look at the growing partisan gender gap as one of the sources. Now, the conventional explanations are twofold. First, some point to the partisan gender gap among the electorate. It's true that we see these same patterns uh, reflected in the electorate. Women are more likely to vote for Democrats and men on average are more likely to vote for Republicans. And the second explanation is of course the undersupply of Republican women candidates, which is somewhat related to that first explanation. Uh, but there are a couple reasons why we think both of those explanations fall a little bit short. So the first looking at the partisan gap in the electorate, we see that it's always been high. Dating back to 1980, you had almost a nine point gender gap. Uh, and today, if you're looking at exit polls in presidential voting, which as unreliable they are, offer us probably the best metric for intertemporal comparison, that gap has risen to about 11 points. So it is true that you could argue that the gender gap has gotten wider, but perhaps not as significantly among the electorate as it has among elected representatives in Congress. So to put that more concretely, the gender gap since 1985 in Congress has uh, risen from zero to 60 seats between the parties. Among the electorate, it's increased by a maximum of about four points. And the other thing to note is that in contrast to our last slide, which showed this steady rise in the gender gap between the Democrats and Republicans in Congress, the swings in the electorate haven't had either the drama in terms of magnitude, but also direction. We saw times in this period between 1980 and 2016 when most scholarly accounts would agree actually the gender gap among the electorate uh, got less severe, and yet the gender gap among members of Congress has increased steadily. The second explanation would be that undersupply story, that there just aren't enough women Republicans running. Uh, but there are two problems with this. The first is that an undersupply story itself uh, is arguably endogenous. Uh, you can't construct a complete causal story. And the reason is something we'll get to later in our presentation, which is if you say that there are voter biases against women candidates and women candidates don't run because they're aware of those voter biases, can you really say the undersupply is the complete causal story for why we have women's underrepresentation? We think that that's a flawed argument or at best an incomplete argument. And then the other reason that we are, are skeptical of this conventional account is that it's unclear why this problem of undersupply should have increased in magnitude over the past years, despite the fact that candidate access to the ballot has been greatly democratized over the years. We see more candidates running, and therefore we should see arguably less in gender barriers to candidacy as well. So for those two reasons, we enter this project skeptical of the conventional narratives around uh, the gender cap uh, within Congress. So our story uh, is focused on the electoral institutions that create these uh, gender biases in representation and specifically safe seats. So we see the partisan gap as a function of declining electoral competition. We provide evidence and we hypothesize initially that women candidates are gonna outperform men in democratic safe seats, but crucially they're gonna underperform men in Republican safe seats. And we'd say that because of that, the recent rise in safe seats, the exponential growth of safe seats among both parties can help contribute to that explanation of why this partisan gap has grown over the period of time we're studying. Um, the prior literature really builds to that hypothesis in three separate ways. So the first is there's a wide body of evidence about how women candidates are stereotyped as more liberal than men. That goes back into the 1990s, but with more recent uh, additions like Sanbon Matsu and Dolan in 2009, seems to be a pattern that is still well and alive. We also see some evidence in the literature that safe seats are intensifying the importance of primaries and thereby ex extremism because the primary mode of competition is no longer this general election where uh, politicians are supposedly competing for the median voter, but rather the primary where they're competing for the median primary voter. And we're also gonna present some evidence in addition to this prior literature for why we think that effect holds and why we think these safe seats encourage extremisms. And then the final thing we are going to talk about uh, is a combination of both a literature on how safe seats have been on the rise over the past decade, and also a new data set we've put together to document precisely how much they have risen over this period of time. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to preview our, our arguments about safe seats and extremism.
Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks, Akil. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of elaborate on this last two points that Akil had about the importance of safe seats and their increase. And this is a part of our broader project on you know, the role of electoral competition and party governance, but I think it's very relevant to today's paper as well. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes on that. Um, so um, first, uh, you know, I just want to kind of present this very kind of basic graph which plots you know, the ideology of a certain representative alongside their, uh, you know, the partisan composition of their constituency. And, you know, this graph uh, basically shows that uh, in places with more Democrats, you have more liberal representatives in terms of the voting patterns. And in places with more, uh, you know, Republicans, you have representatives who vote more conservatively, quote unquote, as measured by DW nominate score, which of course we know has certain limitations, but well, we can also show that this picture is pretty much stays, uh, staying the same regardless of what measure you use, whether it's CF scores, DW nominate score, scores, or some kind of interest group scores. And you know, oftentimes when you see this picture, I think the first thing that pops up, which we fully acknowledge is that, you know, if you take a given district with a certain composition, let's say a uh, district with a you know, more or less, uh, even partisan composition of Democrats, or Republicans, you know, depending on whether it's represented by a Democrat or Republican, the DW nominate score, the ideology of representative and their voting patterns can be very different. And it's true, but what we, what we also see here is that, you know, it is also true that depending on the partisan composition of a certain district, whether it's a safe Democratic seats or a safe uh, Republican seats, the voting patterns of representatives are very much different. And, you know, we don't wanna kind of have any normative ideas about whether it's bad or good, but I think it's also important to have some kind of comparative lens and think about whether it's truly need to be the case. So for instance, if we kind of consider not just the US, but kind of other, you know, two party democracies, then we can also see that actually it doesn't have to be the case that, you know, a place with a more, uh, you know, like a safer constituency for a certain party it has to have a very different voting patterns. You know, if the party has control over candidates and, you know, kind of institutions are different. So why is it the case that, you know, safer seats produce more extreme candidates? So there are three main reasons for that, that, you know, kind of we want to emphasize the, you know, first most obviously is that, you know, obviously if you have a very safe democratic seats that probably it is the case that on average, uh, you know, it has more extreme democratic voters. And so the, re you know, the representatives are kind of responding uh, respond, uh, responding to this more extreme voters. Uh, it is actually more um, convoluted the story than you might think. And for instance, you know, Jonathan Rodden, one of our discussants yeah, has a very good evidence on that, that you can easily imagine that you can have a majority democratic district that mostly voted for Biden, but it's actually not that extreme in terms of its voting population. But it's still the case that on average, of course, you know, they have say democratic seats is going to be more extreme in terms of the voters there. It's also the case that when you have a safe democratic seats uh, in terms of campaign finance, there are going to be more demand for outside uh, money there. And it is interesting because sometimes we don't really kind of consider that you have a safe democratic seats. Actually, it still requires a lot of you know, funds and money to actually campaign in those places. But it is the case that in those places we see more reliance on interest groups and kind of outside uh, money in terms of, you know, out of district spending as well. But most importantly for our purposes here, I would like to emphasize that in safer seats, whether it's de democratic or Republican seats, we have more vulnerability to more uh, primary challengers and also more extreme primary challengers. And I just wanted to show you like a few graphs that can be relevant to what we're talking about here, right? So first, if we just consider the universe of primary challengers and, you know, the incumbents who have to face these challenges, we see that the primary challenges are usually more ideologically extreme, as measured as CF scores here, which is based on campaign finance networks. So what we see here is basically when we look at challengers that are um, blue dots here, they on average you know, a higher in this violent plots, which means they have kind of more conservative quote unquote ideology compared to the incumbents in those districts. And we see the kind of opposite picture for that for Democrats. So we see that if we look at democratic challengers in safer seats or more generally, they're usually more extreme than those uh, that are of incumbents. Um, but most importantly for our purposes, we also see that if you are in a safe seat, which is measured by this uh, Cook Partisan Voting Index that Akil is gonna talk a little bit more about, 
later we see that you know uh, representatives uh, and incumbents in those districts are more likely to face primary challenge and actually even more so the case in Republican safe seats. Another uh, kind of part of the puzzle, which is important for our story here, which is not a part of the paper, is that we see a gradual decline in electoral competition uh, for um, U.S. House uh, across years. Um, so, you know, obviously we have redistricting, we have uh, sort of like oscillations here and there, but in general, the trend is on decline. So this is just, uh, you know, um, uh, see it safety based on you know basic margin of victory, but we can also see the same story when it comes to kind of more ex ante measure of competitiveness based on this uh, partisan voting index, where we see that there is a decline, has been a decline of marginal seats since 1992, since you know when we had the data, and we also have a slight increase of Democratic and especially Republican safe seats. Okay, Akil, I think I can uh, go back to you now. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so connecting the story of safe seats and extremism back to our original theory, what we'd posit then is that Democratic women should perform better in safe Democratic seats, whereas Republican women should be dramatically outperformed in safe Republican seats. And so to, to really study this problem in a more rigorous way, we combine two existing data sets and append some metrics uh, that we think are lacking in them so far. So first we start with Adam Bonica's 2019 database of ideology and money in elections uh, to identify all of the candidates who have filed with the FEC to run for Congress and some basic demographic information of them, uh, both on the campaign finance side and also personal demographic information like gender. And the nice thing about this data set is we also get a sense of their actual electoral fortunes. Then we take a data set from uh, Cook Political uh, to look at the Cook PVI, which is a measure of the partisan composition on electoral competitiveness of House districts. So the way to think of a Cook PVI is as a relative measure. So if we say a district is Democrat plus five, that means in a year where Democrats and Republicans tied overall across the nation, we would expect that district to have voted five points more for the Democratic candidate than the Republican candidate. Uh, and the first thing that we try to do is just a pretty basic descriptive task. Uh, so right here, what we see is the modeled win probability for uh, the Democratic and Republican candidates uh, by their seat safety and by gender. So just to walk us through this really quickly, the top panels are all Republicans. Uh, and what we see here is that looking at the leftmost panel, which is the overall win rate, for the vast majority of seats, you see almost gender parity in that the probability that a woman or a man who enters the primary election has virtually the same probability of winning the election. Now, I should caution that these are probably conservative estimates of gender bias, because as Anzia and Barry have very famously shown, women candidates who actually enter elections are often of higher quality than their male counterparts. Uh, but the important takeaway here is that even though you have gender parity for the vast majority of seats, you see divergence among these very safe seats uh, on the right. And you might think, well, how many seats can it be uh, that are more than R plus 20? How big of a problem this is? Actually, it's a fairly substantial problem. In this current Congress, about a fourth of all seats are in that range where we see that divergence on the Republican side. And on the Democrats, Democratic side, you also see a slightly stark pattern in the opposite direction, which is that in the safe Democratic seats, women are advantaged in their overall likelihood of winning. Again, this is conditional on them entering the primary, uh, which suggests they may be of higher quality than their male challengers. But as you get into more competitive seats, you see that advantage fade away and you actually see some evidence of a disadvantage. This is all to say that from a purely descriptive account, it does seem as though women candidates are advantaged in the Democratic side in safer seats and disadvantaged on the Republican side in safer seats. And that gender gap we showed does seem to originate partially in safer seats. But when we add slightly more rigorous methods uh, and control for other potentially confounding variables, does this relationship still hold up? Our answer, uh, at least as far as we've tested it, seems to be yes, that as you get more extreme seats, uh, the, the relationship right here, this our, our fourth variable that we have listed, 
um, female times PVI, that's the interaction effect between your seat getting safer in the conservative direction and a woman candidate. So these estimates would suggest in very liberal seats, you should see, which would have negative PVIs, you'd see an advantage to being a woman versus in very conservative seats, you would see a stark disadvantage, uh, which supports the descriptive finding that we had in the last slide. And so now we wanna return back to one of the uh, important alternative uh, hypotheses that we presented at the beginning that the conventional explanation literature holds, which is that you know, part of this reason that you see that stark relationship between seat safety uh, and, and women candidates could be candidate supply. And we do find actually evidence that candidate supply starkly differs between Democrats and Republicans. But what's important to us is we also see that that relationship differs in terms of seat safety, that yes, you have that overall decline, uh, that overall partisan gap, excuse me, in women who run, but as seats trend towards safer Republican seats, less and less women are running for Congress, which suggests that this safe seat explanation cannot be explained simply by the overall raw partisan gender gap itself. Uh, and because of that, we think that this is an important domain for future research and an important way of understanding why we've gotten to a point where the dynamics of Congress are such that, you know, women Democrats are, are on the rise, but women Republicans have seen pretty anemic growth uh, since, the, the, uh, since the 1980s. Um, and one thing that I just want to mention before we move on to the discussion is a potential challenge for our case, one would think could be this most recent set of elections, 2020. Of course, famously in 2020, almost every single Republican who defeated an incumbent Democrat was a woman or a candidate of color. But actually, when we go through and look at the, the evidence, we do see further evidence for our theory in that it was only in these competitive seats that the Republican women were able to win. And actually they made very little headway in the much safer seats. Um, and so finally, I just wanna end with a couple of questions that we wanna pose out into the ether. Uh, so the first is how should we think about nonpartisan democratic aims in the context of redistricting? Oftentimes the discourse on gerrymandering is talking about partisan gerrymandering. Uh, and goes to this question of substantive representation, as Pitkin would put it. Uh, but what we're really talking about is descriptive representation. And we think that in line with these findings, there are also important descriptive consequences of safe seats through things like majority minority districts. It's important to think about these nonpartisan democratic aims uh, when we're considering something as partisan as redistricting. Our second question is what we presented here today has been um, large, uh, entirely observational evidence. Uh, so one of the questions that we have going forward are, are there ways to gather more experimental or quasi-experimental evidence on this phenomenon? And in terms of future research, just to set that up, one of the outstanding questions is, how do the few women who do win in these safe Republican seats respond to these pressures? And we're thinking of recent examples of people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, for example. Um, and that brings us to the end of our prepared presentation. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation to comment on this terrific paper. Uh, this, this paper examines one of the most uh, salient and interesting changes in Congress over recent decades, and that is the divergence in the gender composition of the two parties. Before 1990, women were slowly increasing their presence in both congressional parties. But after 1990, the two parties diverged after the so-called year of the woman in 1992, women steadily and sharply increased as a share of the Democratic Party in Congress. By contrast, Republicans stopped becoming more gender diverse for 20 years after 2004. The first significant increase in Republican women just happened with the 2020 elections, a 75% jump over the preceding Congress. So 2020 was unquestionably the year of the Republican woman. But even after the 2020 boost for Republicans, the gender discrepancy between the parties is still wide. Nearly 40% of congressional Democrats are women as compared to 14% of congressional Republicans. This remarkable partisan divergence in women's representation is just one among other forms of sociological divergence between the parties. Just for perspective, I'll highlight a couple of other cases of social sorting in Congress. Uh, 
Now, religion. I'll focus on evangelical Christians, the largest religious group in the U.S., constituting just over a quarter of the population. In the late 1970s, evangelicals made up roughly the same share of both congressional parties. But since the 80s, evangelicals have steadily sorted out of the Democratic Party and into the Republican Party. In recent Congresses, evangelicals make up more than one third of Republicans, but less than 5% of Democrats. Race another form of social sorting. As the U.S. population has become more racially diverse since the 1960s, virtually all of that diversity is represented in the Democratic Party in Congress. The Democratic Party in Congress has grown steadily more racially and ethnically diverse since the 1970s, such that 40 percent of the party in Congress is currently Black, Hispanic, or Asian. Meanwhile, the nation's increasing diversity is just passing the Republican Party by, Non-whites have never made up more than 7% of Republicans in Congress. So the parties have been sorting out in sociological terms. The parties are not just polarized ideologically. They're also strongly differentiated in terms of personal identity. The paper we're discussing today helps give us some new perspective on factors that are driving these changes in congressional composition. The paper argues that increases in the number of safe seats affect the two parties differently. Women candidates are more competitive for safe Democratic Party seats, but less competitive for safe Republican seats. Thus, the rise in safe seats can help shed some light on what's happening in both parties. The processes laid out in this paper involve multiple steps. The paper theorizes that seat, seat safety affects the decision to run, who wins in primaries, and who wins in the general election. Seat safety is thought to affect each of these steps in the process. As the, uh, as the authors continue to work on this paper, I'd like to see a more careful breakdown of each step. Ideally, the paper would nail down the extent to which each of these factors contributes to the overall pattern. It would be great to see the descriptive statistics, you know, even without any controls as a first order matter. What is the difference between safe Republican districts and those that are marginal for Republicans in terms of the number of women running in the primaries, the likelihood that a woman wins the primary, the likelihood that a woman wins a general election? And what are the differences between safe Democratic districts and those that are marginal for Democrats on those dimensions? And what are the effect sizes at each step? My key recommendation is that uh, I think it'd be useful to model the two parties separately. The party works with one overall model, assuming that seat safety affects female candidates in both parties in ways that can be handled with simple interaction effects. But there are reasons to think that the effects of safe seats on candidacy may differ for the two parties. I can think of three ways in which gender might affect congressional elections and candidacy. First, and this is the one that's covered uh, in most depth in the paper, women are perceived as more liberal, which is a disadvantage in safe Republican districts and an advantage in safe Democratic districts. The, um, the, pa the, the paper substantially elaborates on that. But there are other reasons beyond voter perceptions to expect that safe seats will affect gender representation. There's perception and then there's reality. Women actually are more liberal, even among Republicans, such that there is a smaller pool of potential female Republicans considering a run for office in conservative districts. This is something Danielle Thompson finds in her research on state legislatures. In an article published in Legislative Studies Quarterly in 2015, Thompson finds that there's a dearth of very conservative women suitable to make a, con a competitive bid for Congress in those strongly Republican districts. She suggests that the pool of very conservative women may be growing, but it was still small as part of uh, as of her study in 2015. There simply weren't many quality Republican women candidates available to run in conservative districts, meaning conservative women who had won elected office at some level before. But the same pattern doesn't exist for uh, the Democratic Party. Thompson finds that there's a substantial pool of moderate women available in state legislatures able to make a bid for Congress. So there's no shortage of Democratic women available to run in both moderate and liberal districts. 
Third, potential women candidates may have a differential willingness to run in the two parties. Women may look at the Republican Party in Congress and see themselves not fitting in. After all, it's an overwhelmingly male-dominated party. Women may not look at the congressional GOP and see a caucus in which they feel likely that they'll be able to advance their personal and policy goals. But women probably don't look at the Democratic Party similarly. They're likely to perceive the Congressional Democratic Caucus as one where they might fit in and be able to uh, advance their personal uh, the safe seats logic laid out in the paper works somewhat differently for the two parties. Democratic Party is reasonably friendly to women candidates across the board. Meanwhile, Republicans, Republican women probably face a tougher road where they are more disadvantaged in conservative districts than Democratic women are disadvantaged in swing districts. If these kinds of asymmetries exist, the model used in the paper which includes candidates of both parties, will likely understate the gender effect for Republicans and overstate the gender effect for Democrats. So I'd like to see a separate model for, for the two parties. And does seat safety have a significant effect on women's candidacies for both parties? Second point I'd like to make is just a note of caution. I really think the authors are onto something here with this argument about how safe seats affect gender representation, but it's important to note that there's a limit to how much this logic can explain. No doubt there's been a major change in congressional elections. There are far more seat, safe seats today than there were in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, so here's a figure from, uh, from other work by the authors. As is evident here, it used to be that more than 40% of House districts had elections decided in the marginal range, and now it's around 10%. But most of that change happened a long time ago. David Mayhew published his famous paper on the vanishing marginals in 1974. There has been continued decline in almost 50 years since, but the post-1974 change is less than the change that occurred in the 50 years before 1974. Meanwhile, recall that the gender sorting of the parties only got, away, got underway after 1990. Before 1990, the share of women in the two congressional parties was low, but growing in tandem. It's only after 1990 that we see the divergence this paper aims to explain. The share in this, uh, the change in the share of safe seats since 1992 is just a few percentage points. So it's not a dramatic drop since the 90s. Given that seat safety hasn't changed a lot in recent years, safe seats can only explain part of the gender sorting that we've seen since 1990. Now, I'm persuaded that the authors are really onto something here. I suspect that the analysis will hold up to further robustness checks, including, as I recommend, splitting the data by party. But clearly, there's much more to learn about what's driving congressional parties apart along lines of gender and other sociological factors. Before I conclude, I'd like to make one final small point. The paper often implies that the decline of competition in congressional races stems from partisan gerrymandering. This linkage is often suggested in the popular press. But political scientists working on this subject have not been able to document uh, uh, an effect along these lines. Here's a, a representative finding in the literature from a 2006 JOP paper by Abramowitz, Alexander, and Gunning. A, pa a paper that's uh, cited uh, in, uh, uh, in the paper we're discussing. Um, uh, Abramowitz and his co-authors look at the number of safe and competitive House seats before and after three recent rounds of redistricting. So you can see from the, in, the 1980 and then the, the number of safe seats in 1982, the number of safe and competitive seats in 1990, and then after the redistricting in 1992 and so forth. And they find that redistricting does not substantially increase the share of safe and competitive seats. And they conclude that at the national level, redistricting has a negligible impact on the competitiveness of House seats. The reason why partisan gerrymandering does not um, ha have a you know, consistent effect on uh, electoral competition is that partisan, the goal of partisan gerrymandering is not to maximize seat safety.
The goal of partisan gerrymandering is to maximize the number of winnable seats for a party. Effective gerrymandering cannot pack too many of a party's voters into a single district if it wants to win as many seats as possible. Gerrymanderers will often have to go to their own party's incumbents to get them to agree to reduce their cushion of support so as to spread out more of their party's voters into neighboring seats. The goal of gerrymandering is to make as many winnable seats as possible, but doing so will tend to depress a party's margin of victory in those districts. Now, of course, it's also true that partisan gerrymanderers may aim to pack the opposing party's voters into as few seats as possible. And doing this obviously makes for some very safe seats like the overwhelmingly Democratic majority minority districts. But gerrymanderers also try to crack opposing party voters across a lot of seats so that the opposing party doesn't have a very good shot at winning any of them. The bottom line is that taken together, gerrymandering makes some seats safer and other seats more competitive. The overall effect of gerrymandering on competition just tends to wash out. The rise of seat safety in Congress has other causes aside from partisan gerrymandering. This is not a critical point for this paper given that the paper isn't even about the causes of safe seats anyway. But just to uh, steer the authors away from unnecessary controversy uh, in the write-up. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think that's probably, can everyone see that okay? I don't, I only have, uh, only have two slides. And one of them is actually from the, uh, from the authors. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off by just saying thank you. And I really enjoyed this opportunity. I enjoyed reading the paper. I think it's a great topic. It's, uh, it's a really, uh, it's a, it's a really useful data uh, exercise. And they're just some really interesting stylized facts that are starting to emerge. Uh, I think the first time I read through the paper, I was, I, I, I felt, you know, like I was kind of convinced by what the authors were saying and, and, uh, wasn't sure what I would have to say, but then on looking at it more carefully, uh, I started to have a lot more questions, and uh, and some of them are about the theory, and some of them are about the empirics, and uh, I'll kind of uh, I'll dive into both of those. Um, the first thing I want to do is just uh, is just to say a little bit about the ways of framing the paper. I mean, obviously, there's a lot. Um, there's a you have some 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 folks among you uh, among the authors who know a lot about the cross national literature on gender and representation, and uh, and maybe maybe linking this in with a, a larger literature on uh, on gender and you know, why the U.S. perhaps is a is a does this paper help us understand why the U.S. is an outlier relative to other countries? Might be an interesting framing device to consider. But also, um, uh, the, in the U.S. literature, one paper I wanted to direct your attention to is by a former student of mine, Sarah Anzia, has a paper with using a, a really large data set from California in which she finds kind of surprising evidence of an of a advantage for female candidates in a lot of local offices and finds that the um, that there is something about the nature of those offices that the advantage is largest for school board races and it gets a little smaller for city council races and a little smaller for mayoral uh, elections. But she also finds some uh, evidence that's consistent with yours. It says that this this uh, basically disappears, this, this female advantage disappears, the more uh, conservative the districts become, which is perhaps not too surprising. Um, I also think there's a related literature on local governments in the U.S. that might be nice to also think about that where, where the, the story is that um, one emerging story, and it's one that I've, I've seen in some data I've looked at, is that when we look at at-large districts versus uh, you know, when the same people are, re are represented in at-large districts versus uh, single-member district elections, the um, the at large districts are better are, are better for female recruitment. We end up with more female candidates running and more female candidates winning, and that probably has something to do with comp competition competitiveness in um, you know in winner take all municipal uh, uh, city council elections are often very uncompetitive, and there are long standing incumbents hanging around uh, who are, are, are these, these are people who uh, a, a, a female candidate might might be less inclined to 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 jump in and try to challenge than um, maybe a, a say a seven member school board that has three seats up three at large seats up two of which might be open seats effectively uh, that's a very different kind of setting so this 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 kind of literature I think is very related to what you're doing in the congressional context and uh, and I would and, but I would also encourage you to think you know you've got several authors and hopefully a lot of time on your hands maybe uh, it would be a very small lift to add state legislatures to this study.
uh, this Carl Klarner data set on um, on state legislatures could be linked with the dime data, and you could be up and running doing some similar kind of analysis with state legislatures, and that would just give you a larger sample and some some interesting cross state heterogeneity and, and all of that. Uh, so uh, that would be a, a, a nice thing to to think about doing. Um, so one thing that I thought. Um, I thought Frances might get into. Um, so she definitely checked the box on the gerrymandering. So everything she said about gerrymandering, I agree with. I think it's good. It's good to have you know when when people two people have the same reaction, it's good to know what that is. I don't I don't think this is a paper about gerrymandering per se. It's a paper about safe seats, and so you don't need to make those arguments about gerrymandering. Um, but um, I, I something that I thought might come up is just a, I was surprised not to see incumbency at least among the control variables. Uh, even 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 uh, more, I thought. It might make sense as a as something to explore heterogeneous effects. You know, are, are we talking about what happens when we look at open seats versus seats where there are longstanding incumbents? You know, I, I think that um, uh, incumbency, of course, is is highly correlated with uh, with the safety of the seats, and a lot of those safe seats are going to be ones when there is uh, an incumbent, uh, a longstanding incumbent running, and some of the people in your data set you're looking at, some of these challengers are going to be not particularly serious challengers because it's someone who everyone knows is going to win um, both the primary and the general. Um, and then there are um, situations, though, even in a very even in a very safe seat where a longstanding incumbent uh, steps down and then there's an open seat. I just I, surely the, the dynamics are different in those. And so it would be it'd be useful to to uh, take a, a look at those separately. Um, I also want to think about maybe, uh, uh, of course, you know, you, you, I, I have to say something about political geography and, and, and uh, think about how that might matter. Um, it, one possible alternative hypothesis is, you know, is if you just look at the correlation between the between the Cook index and population density, the correlation is like, you know, it's like 0.9 or something. It's very high. Um, uh, you know, this 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 thing that you know the main independent variable here or the interaction term is is very much correlated with uh, with uh, geography in a particular way. So that the safe seats are essentially safe Republican seats are very rural. Safe uh, safe uh, Democratic seats are almost always urban, with a couple of exceptions in the Deep South and. Um, uh, majority minority districts there but for the most part these competitive districts are going to be suburban districts and uh and as as, as one of you kind of mentioned some of those suburban districts and some of these you know 50 50 districts can actually end up being internally quite polarized they can be if you, if you look at people's preferences within the districts you end up with this kind of bimodal distribution of of uh, of political preferences and so i want to kind of come back to that that thought in in a moment um, but, um, but, but, but what this, and I, I just want to get, you know, I actually want to hear back from the authors, just how they see the argument working, because the story they want to tell, as I understand in the paper and the presentation, is that it's about perceptions of candidates' platforms, that people, in a sense, misperceive uh, the, they believe the female candidates to be more, cons to more, to be more liberal than they might actually be. Be. So there's some kind of a penalty that applies to a female candidate who's trying to run in a conservative district where she has to really try hard. She has to kind of uh, do some things to signal that she really is conservative because uh, gender is a cue that people are using. And so that's that I understand to be the mechanism, that it's about perception of the candidate. But there's this alternative mechanism, which is just that um, over time, Democrats have become more progressive on gender issues in general, and that something about that is highly correlated with their ability, their desire to, or their you know their bias against uh, female candidates, and so that over time, Democratic voters uh, in the Democratic districts have become less. Uh, biased against female candidates, but in these relatively rural districts uh, where people are more traditional on economic issues uh, and and social issues, I mean, particularly what we care about here is social issues and gender issues. That in those places, um, people uh, that the, the things haven't really changed, and that accounts for the for the different trajectories, not really this perception issue. And so, I would encourage you to think about empirically how can we disentangle these things, these different possible mechanisms. And one way might be if you go in the CCES. There are questions in there that ask respondents what they think the candidates' platforms are on a seven-point scale and on some different policy issues. So can you kind of show what you believe to be going is going on, that, that people are misperceiving or they are somehow uh, overestimating the um, the uh, the the, the, the um, kind of leftist orientation of women, even in the Republican Party, something like that. Um, 
Um, but so I guess one of the things I really want to talk about, though, is that as you were doing the presentation, it's because you handed it off from Alex to Akil, I felt like there was something important in the in the in the theoretical argument that was missing. I didn't quite understand. And also when I read the paper, what is it about seat safety and the Cook Index that you really think matters? Um, I, it, it's it's this idea again. It's about potential misperception of female candidates ideology. But I, I want to understand, and I, and I think you probably do have an, a, a logic here that makes sense, but I just, it's not spelled out as, as crisply as I'd like. What is it that's different about a safe seat district than a, than a competitive district? Or in my language, what is it that's different about a rural district than a suburban district? Um, and I think what you're saying is that the primary electorate is different in some important way. Um, but what exactly is it that is different about the primary electorate in the rural district? Is it just the number? Is it like a, I think it might help to have a little, a little toy formal model here, whether it's something like an ideological cut point, and then there's this misperception, like is the misperception larger in those places? Is like it harder to credibly commit as a female to have the, to, to kind of be closer to the ideological platform preferred by the medium voter? Is it kind of a, that kind of a commitment problem that's larger? Or is it just like the number of voters who are past some threshold is larger? It wasn't clear to me exactly how that argument worked. Um, um, uh, it, that could have been clear. Okay, so uh, on the on the empirics, um, um, I agreed with a, a lot. Uh, it just again, it's kind of helpful to know that two people have the same reaction. I agreed that it would be nice to just see the data, just to see to kind of cascade down from the the question of who who runs in the primary, who wins in the primary, and then who wins in the general. I have exactly that same thing in my notes. That you want to go through that, you want to show us the uh, just the raw descriptive statistics. That would be great. Um, um, but one thing I, I just wanted to talk about, though, that I'm confused by, and I hope you can help me with, is what's going on in figure two. Because um, I, when you went through it in the presentation, we just talked about the left-hand panel. And we talked that essentially all the emphasis is on that gap on the upper left-hand panel here between that dotted line or the dashed line and the solid line. Um, but in the paper, we are told that it's really that there's this big difference between primary elections, uh, uh, between uh, safe seats and uh, and competitive seats for Republican women in primary elections. When I look at that middle uh, that middle panel, I just don't see it. I see a couple of lines that are right on top of each other, and I see confidence intervals that suggest to me that there's absolutely no difference uh, at any level. Of, um, of competitiveness between a, a woman's win probability and a man's win probability in the uh, Republican primary. And when I go to the right-hand panel, I look at the general election, I also don't see any difference. I see something strange happening where the, the Stata has apparently uh, not wanted to finish the local polynomial as we move to the right past like 20 something for, uh, for females. And so maybe there's a big gap there, but we're not seeing it because I, I just don't understand how we get to the overall gap when we don't see the gap in the primaries. Because the story in, in, in table A2 is that there's a three percentage point difference for females throughout the whole range. And it gets even bigger as we get into these safe seats. So it's not showing up in these local polynomial plots. And I guess my big question is why. Um, and uh, like, I, I almost don't think figure two and table A2 can both be correct. Um, I, so, so I just want to know what's happening there. But I certainly do see, um, I, I do see a big, uh, an, an interesting effect here for, um, for Democratic, uh, on the Democratic side between, between uh, men and women. So um, um, I think I'm probably running short on time. I should probably just wrap it up here. Um, uh, but I, I think that it, the, the, the big findings for me is, you know, I, I'd like to know, um, whether this, you know, whether this safe seat thing for the Republicans is, is, is going to hold up and how big it is, but there's, I'm certainly looks like there's something there for the, for the Democrats. Um, but it also looks like, you know, you have some really powerful evidence that there's just a big difference in, uh, in who, uh, in, in, in who runs that at the end of the day, that that's one of the things that really hit me between the eyes, that there is a big difference in, um, in, in just a candidate recruitment. And um, uh, and that those kind of those things are kind of working together. This effect for for Democrats in safe seats, which seems to be very very large, uh, and and um, I'm not you know, I'm not sure whether this the one on the Republican side. If you could just help me with figure two, um, um, but uh, 
the really big thing is is the is just the difference in in, in who runs in, in, right. in, in what and what I'm looking at here. Um, uh, all right, I think plenty plenty for us to talk about there. So I'll turn it back Thanks over to you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, so I, given the time, I just want to know: uh, Do the do the uh, author presenters uh, want to make like one or two quick remarks, and then we can go to questions if if the audience has questions. Uh, you can also pass if you want to pass. It's totally it's a it's totally your your call. I think these were you know really fantastic and thought provoking discussions, and you could easily spend an hour I think on on Francis's remarks and on Jonathan's, but we don't have an hour. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I agree with that. So I'm I'm inclined to to pass, and if okay. Akiva and Alex want to uh, respond, is that, is that okay, uh, Alex and uh, Akil? That we go to the questions. But thumbs up, excellent. Okay, Ian, take it away. Uh, I think you have a question. Or, um, hands raised. Uh, you're you're in you're in you're in control. Okay, I'm not seeing any hand raised, but I am seeing a question in the chat, which says Republican states are generally seen as having strong Christian views, whereas Democratic ones are a bit liberal in terms of Christian views. Do you think this approach does shape the opportunity given to women politically, given that Christianity generally frowns on women taking leadership positions in society? Anyone want to? I think in general, if I may just uh, say a few words, I think it kind of taps into some of the comments uh, brought up by our discussion, which were excellent, by the way, and we, you know, really take everything really well, especially, you know, the gerrymandering comment, I think that we should really tone it down because I don't think we believe that gerrymandering is the key here. Uh, but when it comes to Christianity, I think it's the same question as some of you had was whether we're talking about perceptions uh, related to gender or the reality that women candidate can actually be more liberal on average than men. I think for our story, it's not necessarily the case that we only care about perception, it can be both actually. And the fact that it turns out that in safer Republican seats, you have rural population with more traditional gender views. Uh, and, you know, it just disadvantages women in general who want to kind of, you know, run for office in this district. I don't necessarily think that it's not in line with our theory, which is some kind of alternative explanation. I think it's pretty much in line with what we're trying to say. But I totally agree that, you know, we have to be clear about what's so special about safe seats uh, relative to like a toss up. Um, I was going to say, if, if while you're waiting for hands to go up or questions to be asked, you should certainly feel free in the gaps to respond to Francis or Jonathan, if, if you would, if you would like um, to. So one, one thing, um, Akil, uh, I don't know if you wanted to pick up on this, but on Francis's point that um, the, the rise of safe seats has been going on for a long time and in the period we're talking about, it, it hasn't been that much of an increase. Um, on, that's, that's true, obviously, on the one hand, but on the other hand, we do have data about the partisan difference in the growth of safe seats in recent decades. So uh, do, do you have any comment on, on that as a response to how much of the heavy lifting the uh, safe seats can do? Yeah, I actually wanted to say a few words about it. I think Akil might be useful if you can uh, say a few words about figure two and its discrepancy with the regression table since you uh, worked on it more. Uh, but so with regard to the evidence on safe seats, so I think it's true that if you look just uh, at the measure of margin of victory, you don't really see a lot of difference in the last 20 or 30 years. But I think this measure in general is very kind of not very robust, right? That's why I feel comfortable plotting it starting right after civil war and these, in general, you see this kind of downward trend, but I think if you kind of want to zoom in and look at the trajectory within 20 or 30 years, I think it's not as easy to do that because of, you know, different uh, the, the redistricting and other also changes that have occurred. Right? I think that's why I think the Cook partisan voting index is more robust as a measure of ex ante competitiveness, right? So where we look at the partisan composition and the two elections prior relative to the uh, you know, nation in general. I think if you look at the Cook partisan voting index and the trajectory in the last 30 years, starting in 1990, we actually we have this evidence that safe seats have been 
on decrease, right? Uh, pretty, you know, steadily, right? It's not a huge change. And we, unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of, I think it's possible to construct it, but we don't really have this data at hand with regard to PBI prior to 1990. But I believe if we did have it, probably would see that it's been, you know, in decline since before that as well. Okay, before Akil takes up Jonathan's question about figure two, um, I see we do have a question from Gail. So I just joined your session a little bit late, but um, my question is, because this uh, um, discussion has re revolved around women um, seeking candidacy, candidacy and safe seats, I just wanted to get your impression on the Republican Party's attempt to attempt on voter suppression um, and gerrymandering, what impact do you think this will have on the potential for women running for congressional offices? So why don't, while you think about that, why don't we get Natsine's question as well? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hi, so I'm new to all of this and I'm just a high school senior and I'm not even sure if I'm understanding all of this right, but... Hello? No, you come back, yeah. Hi, so I'm wondering if the person who is responsible for gerrymandering is the state legislatures and that means that uh, they are allowed to increase or decrease safe seats and competitive seats in like a district, does that mean that state legislatures in theory can manipulate like female representative in an area? Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think presumably in theory, and that's, I think that's one that actually just look at the paper and I think that's one of the we use the word gerrymandering twice in the paper. And I think that's one of the kind of policy suggestions that we have, and that's that's what discussions we're not really happy about. So I, I don't I don't think that. So in theory, it's possible. But I think in practice, uh, you know, due to kind of partisan sorting more generally, that people just tend to leave with someone who is more similar to them ideology, whether you know uh, deliberately or not. It happens that you know. Republicans leave in rural areas with other Republicans and Democrats leave in urban uh, areas with other uh, Democrats. So, you know, the extent to which you can kind of manufacture, uh, you know, safe seats with gerrymandering, I think is very limited, but you can imagine how it is possible and then thereby affect, you know, the proportion of female representation. But I, I don't think that's a big concern. And I think the same kind of answer I would have with regard to voter suppression, which is, you know, a very important issue, but I'm not sure how exactly it would play out with regard to the gender dynamic. If any of my uh, colleagues would like to add on that, I would be great. I would just, I would just add um, that whatever the causes of safe seats are, to what extent it's self-sorting, what extent it's demography, to what extent it's gerrymandering, and to what extent it's things like majority minority districts. I don't think to the extent there's any agency involved, human agency and planning, I don't think anybody was intending it to reduce female representation in the Republican side relative to the Democratic side. I think it's an unintended side effect of whatever has been done by people, is my guess. Yeah, and just to, to jump in there, because I think, um, again, taking the, the comments from our two discussants uh, very seriously, I think there is a question, at least for me, which is that when we look at things like majority minority districts, we do see examples of intentional uh, map manipulation, if you want to call it that, uh, to advance descriptive representation. So I think one of the points that we were trying to make um, with our references to gerrymandering, which noted uh, should be taken out, is not necessarily that that is the cause right now, but that could be a prerogative that gerrymanders think about or people drawing the lines. And I think about this in the context of, for example, the ACLU right now, when they're looking at redistricting for the next year, they're looking at racial redistricting, for example. Uh, we don't have a similar concept for gender redistricting, but perhaps that's something that in the back of our minds, we should keep in mind these unintentional consequences that Professor Shapiro was talking about. 
Okay, um, I see that we're coming up to 8.15, which is um, uh, when we're, when we're uh, scheduled to finish. Um, I just wanna ask first the, um, the discussants, are there any uh, last uh, comments you'd like to make? And then I'll turn to the panelists and ask if there are any last comments that any of the panelists uh, who are presenting their work uh, would like to make. Not for me. Okay, thank you, Francis. Just keep up the good work. I look forward to seeing the next draft of this. Terrific. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and our our panelist authors, is there anything else you'd like to say before we conclude? No, thank you for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Um, well, let me say, um, Francis and Jonathan, you are welcome at any time you want to drop in here to Yale. Um, and it reminds us just how wonderful our colleagues are. Um, out there in the big world. Um, and, uh, and thank you for such thoughtful contributions to the discussion. And of course, thank you to the authors for this you know, illuminating and stimulating uh, paper. This is a dimension to safe seats that I think no one contemplated. And it will definitely affect the way I, I look at um, the patterns of congressional competition moving forward. So again, thank you all so much. With that, um, let me uh, say uh, thank you very much everyone for attending. Our next ISPS Democracy event is on Tuesday, April 13th at 4 p.m. where we will have a panel to discuss novel ideas for elections and legislative decision-making. And please look for future ISPS events at our ISPS website I'd also like to conclude by thanking all of the people who worked so hard to put this event together. The organizers of this panel, they include Pam Green, Pam LaMonica, Tori Bilski, and Lamore Peer. With that, again, thank you all for participating and attending tonight, and I look forward to seeing you at future events. Uh, good night. Good night. Good night.